Yes, and thank you again. Um, this is Tori Haynes again, and I'm here with my colleague, Brett Meadows, and we'll be presenting chapters uh, or draft materials from the environment chapter. Also joining us today are Tony Small from Stormwater and Resource Protection and Danny Poe and Mike Ushock from JCSA. And I did want to mention that we received your comments on this chapter over the weekend, and we're working through those items for you. Next slide. Today, we'll look at some highlights from the technical report, then move into a summary of community guidance received to date. We'll also touch base on the watershed zoning briefing paper and the existing GSAs from the current comp plan. Next slide. Before we jump into the technical report highlights, I just wanted to briefly mention some organizational updates uh, that apply to this chapter since the last comp plan adoption, just in case you're flipping through the current chapter and noticing some different terms and department references, um, it, mostly for our newer members. In 2016, uh, development management was renamed to community development. And at that time, the department housed engineering and resource protection or ERP. And they oversaw things like development plan review, bonding and related items. We also had a stormwater division under general services and they dealt more with county owned stormwater facilities and programs. And in 2017, those two divisions were merged into stormwater and resource protection under general services so that all of those related tasks and programs could be administered under the same division. Next slide. Uh, now I'll jump into some technical report highlights. And I just wanted to mention here and acknowledge that this chapter covers a broad range of topics. Uh, each of which could probably fill their own presentation. So just keep in mind that these highlights are very brief summaries of some of the key topics uh, covered in the technical report. Next slide. This is a glimpse of some facts and figures for James City County, and we'll touch on some of these a little later. Next slide. The county has roughly 152 miles of shoreline, 17 of which are located in the York River watershed. The rest is in the James River watershed. Various organizations and agencies, such as VIMS and the Hampton Roads Planning District Commission, help monitor the conditions of our shorelines and provide coastal resource management assistance to the county. One known ongoing issue is shoreline erosion, which typically ranges from zero to two feet per year. Erosion tends to be especially prevalent along the James River near Jamestown Island. There are a variety of methods to address shoreline erosion. Living shorelines in particular are the favorite method because they take more natural approaches using native plant species installations to protect shorelines rather than structural methods such as seawalls and bulkheads. As of this year, Virginia now requires living shorelines as the preferred method for stabilization, whereas before they were simply recommended. The county is in the process of implementing the living shoreline approach at Chickahominy uh, Riverfront Park in the James City County Marina currently. Next slide. Moving on to water quality, and in this case, we're generally talking about surface water quality. Various natural and man-made actions can impact water quality, such as erosion and agricultural waste, pesticides, and petroleum-based substances. substances. Over 130 pollutants are monitored and waters not meeting certain standards are considered impaired. We work with DEQ to help track and improve impaired waters. Uh, for impaired waters, DEQ sets a total maximum daily load or TMDL and pollutants must uh, be reduced to that TMDL amount. The table in the technical report reflects the most recent TMDL data. Next slide. Here we'll touch on state and county water quality regulations. And this is just a very simplified brief summary of some of the key items that are implemented here in the county. The erosion and sediment control ordinance, that's the first half of chapter eight of the county code, regulates control measures implemented during land disturbance and, constru and construction to reduce erosion, keep loose sediment from leaving sites. The Virginia stormwater management program is the second half of chapter eight and oversees regulations for water quality and quantity, BMP design, and other items related to stormwater runoff. The VIPTES permit is issued for stormwater discharges from construction activities. 
The MS-4 permit is issued to localities who operate a storm sewer system and discharge storm water into local waterways in James City County is an MS-4 locality. And the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Ordinance uh, regulates um, development and other activities within the resource protection and resource management areas to protect sensitive habitats and local waterways. And any areas in James City County that are outside the RPA are considered RMA. Next slide. Related to water quality and stormwater runoff is impervious cover. This is basically any non-porous surface that doesn't allow water to infiltrate naturally. So rainfall is converted into stormwater runoff, which if left unmitigated, can erode stream channels, carry pollutants to waterways, and contribute to local flooding. We often think of roads, sidewalks, and buildings as impervious surfaces, but gravel surfaces and compacted dirt can also be considered impervious. The Chesapeake Bay Ordinance requires 60% max impervious per site were treated to equivalent quality. Next slide. Uh, sanitary sewer overflows are the unintended discharge of wastewater from the sanitary sewer system into the waterways, typically during storm events. So if it rains really hard and the system can't handle it, the wastewater can discharge back out into waterways. In 2007, HRSD and regional localities are placed under a consent order by DEQ to reduce wet weather related SSOs. This required extensive study, repair, and improvement of the wastewater systems. HRSD has proposed a plan to fund and implement rehabilitation and capacity enhancement on a regional basis. And this plan is currently being reviewed by DEQ and the EPA. In the meantime, JCSA has been completing upgrades and repairs to the local system to enhance capacity and reduce SSOs. Next slide. There are 14 watersheds in James City County. Six have county adopted watershed management plans to date, the oldest of which are the Powhatan Creek and Yarmouth Creek plans. The current versions of those plans were adopted in 2006. As noted in the watershed zoning briefing paper, funding was recently requested to update these plans, but they are temporarily on hold during the coronavirus pandemic. Proposed new watershed management plans include Diaskin Creek, Skiffs Creek and College Creek. Also of note is the Lower Chickahominy Watershed Study. This is a five-year study funded by the Virginia Coastal Zone Management Program and facilitated by Plan RBA. The Lower Chickahominy is recognized as one of the most pristine freshwater wetlands in the Mid-Atlantic, and this study will cover James City, Charles City, and New Kent counties with a dual goal of natural resource conservation and economic development. Next slide. Some common agricultural impacts on water quality include animal waste, pesticides, and erosion. The county's Chesapeake Bay Preservation Ordinance offers some regulations such as buffer requirements and pollution reduction standards. Agricultural operations can implement best management practices such as cover crops and rotation practices, conservation tillage, structural erosion control measures, nutrient management planning, and soil and water conservation plans. Agricultural practices can't always be regulated, but in some instances, implementation of ag VMPs can be incentivized by things uh, like cost share programs with the help of organizations like the Colonial Soil and Water Conservation District. This is a separate political subdivision of the state and its jurisdiction covers James City County, as well as York, Charles City, New Kent, and the city of Williamsburg. It's not a regulatory body, but does assist localities and citizens within its jurisdiction on soil and water quality issues. Next slide. Moving on to groundwater, we are currently reliant on groundwater resources for drinking water, but must evaluate alternative water options due to changes with our, with, to our withdrawal permit from DEQ. Some typical impacts to groundwater sources include landfills, pesticides, underground storage tanks, and wells. The latter two can be particularly impactful to the water supply because older tanks, uh, especially from older tanks and wells that were not built to today's standards, it may be old enough that we're not even aware of their existence. 
The county and JCSA conduct well and groundwater data collection, groundwater level tracking, wellhead protection, and implement design standards for BMPs and storage tanks. Next slide. The floodplain ordinance regulates activities within the flood zones and complements the building codes enhanced standards for structures located in flood hazard areas. Updates to the flood insurance rate, rate maps and floodplain ordinance were adopted in 2015 with additional updates up adopted in 2018. The county takes a proactive approach to protecting the community against flood risks by participating in the National Flood Insurance Program's community rating system. These efforts have led to increasingly positive ratings and the county was recently upgraded from a class seven to a class five, which allows for a 25% discount on flood insurance policies to all residents. Next slide. Oh. Oh. Tackling climate change and sea level rise is uh, very much a regional effort while also requiring attention, uh, local attention here in the county. At the state level, the 2018 Virginia Energy Plan helps guide policy throughout the state. One of the goals stated in the plan was to join the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, or REGI, and that work has been ongoing at the state level for the past several years. And just this year, we successfully joined REGI, becoming the first Southern state to do so. Locally in the county, um, we seek ongoing efforts, or we have ongoing efforts to uh, improve energy efficiency in our buildings and in our fleet. We have a green buildings incentive policy as well as, as well as other incentives such as density bonus points and the zoning ordinance for development projects. We also participate in a regional sea level rise planning effort through HRPDC who provides program assistance and data to Hampton Roads localities. We're also anticipating a new study from VIMS focusing on future road inundation risks based on projected sea level rise. We're particularly interested in this study because not only will it show where flooding events occur, it will also take into account the duration of annual impact. So this means we'll have a better idea of which roads will be impacted for short durations versus roads that could be impassable for a substantial amount of time each year. Next slide. Um, some recent county projects that have been completed include the James Terrace Water Quality Improvements, Cooley Road Stream Restoration, and grant awards for the Chickahominy Riverfront Park Shoreline Stabilization and Grice's Run Stream Restoration. Next slide. Now I'll move into community guidance highlights. Next slide. Through the survey and first round of public engagement, one of the public engagement themes most directly related to this chapter is protect the natural environment. In the 2019 citizen survey, over 95% ranked it very important or somewhat important to improve, to improve the natural environment. During the Engage 2045 Summit on the Future, residents indicated support for a broad array of sustainability, resilience, and environmental stewardship measures. The second and third rounds of community engagement are ongoing and the results will be incorporated into the chapter materials as soon as they're available. Next slide. And next we'll discuss the watershed zoning briefing paper. Next slide. This paper provided some background on the county's existing regulations along with some existing watershed management plans and how they're implemented. It provides considerations for sub watershed impervious cover limits, uh, development of regulations and interaction with planning and legal considerations. It also provides concepts that could be explored as an alternative or complementary approaches should regulatory approaches not be permitted by the state or otherwise not pursued. Next slide. With all this in mind, staff is seeking feedback from the PCWG on next steps. Is it the PCWG's guidance to move forward with exploring the approach of regulating impervious cover limitations by subwatershed? If that's not the preferred approach, would it be the PCWG's guidance to explore any other potential approaches listed in the briefing paper? In relation to the question above, is it the PCWG's guidance that additional information on this topic be included in the environment chapter? 
that any specific actions on this topic be included in the GSAs, or that any language encouraging further study of this topic be included in the GSAs. Is there any additional information that would be key to your ability to provide guidance on this issue? And is there any desire to ask citizens for, for input on this issue? Next slide. And finally, we'll discuss the GSAs. Next slide. As with other chapters reviewed so far, staff has not revised the GSAs at this point. We're currently examining potential revisions and have ten tentatively identified some areas for updates. Members of the PCWG are welcome to provide initial suggestions and comments. Next slide.